In this video, we will discuss in detail the anatomy and vascularization of the orbit, complex structure in the human skull that houses the eye and its associated structures. In this regard, we will begin with an introduction that highlights the bony structure of the orbit. Following this, we will describe the shape, orientation, and dimensions of the bony orbit, along with its components. Before concluding, we will review its blood supply. The orbital cavities are pivotal anatomical structures in the human skull. Positioned on either side of the nasal root, these cavities serve as protective enclosures for the eyes and their associated structures, commonly referred to as annexes. These annexes include crucial elements like muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, all vital for the proper functioning of the visual system. Each orbital cavity is uniquely shaped like a quadrangular pyramid. An orbital cavity structure can be dissected into several components, for walls, superior, inferior, medial, and lateral, for rims, which outline the entrance of the orbit, a base, the front part opening on the face, and an apex, the deeper point inside the skull. These walls contain foramina and fissures through which nerves and blood vessels pass, linking the orbit with the cranial cavity and the face. The orbits also have an essential role in facial anatomy. They act as a dividing line between the upper facial skeleton and the middle face. This division is not just a structural demarcation but also influences the aesthetic and functional aspects of the face. Furthermore, the complexity of the orbital cavity is exemplified in its composition. Each orbit is formed by the convergence of seven bones. These include four facial bones and three cranial bones. The orbital cavities, often described as conical structures, present a fascinating aspect of craniofacial anatomy. Their shape is strategically designed, with the bases of these cones opening anteriorly, providing a wide field of vision and protective housing for the eyes. The apices of these cones, however, are oriented in a posteromedial direction, converging towards the central part of the skull. This unique orientation plays a vital role in directing the nerves and blood vessels that connect the eyes to the brain. At the front of each orbit, the base lies prominently at the orbital opening. This opening is not just a passive gateway but a dynamic junction where the orbit meets the facial skeleton. It's this interface that integrates the orbit with the surrounding facial structures, ensuring both functional coordination and aesthetic harmony. The detailed composition of the orbit includes four distinct walls, each serving a specific structural and protective function. The superior wall, often termed the roof, forms the upper boundary of the orbital cavity, separating it from the frontal lobe of the brain. The floor or inferior wall creates the lower limit, playing a crucial role in supporting the eye and its associated structures. The medial wall, one of the thinnest, is situated near the nasal cavity, while the lateral wall, the strongest and most robust, shields the orbit from the temporal fossa. Accompanying these walls are the four rims, marking the periphery of the orbital opening. The base, as previously mentioned, forms the anterior opening onto the facial skeleton, while the apex, located deep within the skull, serves as a convergence point for various nerves and vessels. The orientation and dimensions of the orbit are defined by several key measurements. The height of the orbital margin is about 35 mm, while its width is approximately 40 mm. The depth of the orbit, measured as the length of the medial wall, is roughly 45 mm. The distance between the orbits, known as the interorbital distance, ranges from 27 to 33 mm. Furthermore, the volume of the orbit is less than 30 cubic centimeters. The bones of the orbit are enveloped in a specialized type of periosteum known as the periorbiter. This thin, dense membrane plays a crucial role in the structure of the orbit. Now, we will discuss the components of the orbit, beginning with a description of its walls. These include the roof or superior wall, lateral wall, medial wall, and the floor or inferior wall. In addition to these walls, we will also explore other key features, the base of the orbit, the apex of the orbit, and the openings of the orbit. The roof or superior wall of the orbit is primarily formed by two bones. The anterior portion is mainly composed of the orbital plate of the frontal bone. In contrast, a smaller posterior part is contributed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. This arrangement provides both structural integrity and shape to the orbit. Located on the anterior part of the orbit's roof are two anatomically significant landmarks. One, the lacrimal fossa, this depression, situated anterolaterally, is specifically designed to house the orbital part of the lacrimal gland. 
its strategic positioning facilitates the gland's role in tear production and distribution. 2. The trochlear fossa, fovea positioned anteromedially, it this serves an important function in eye movement as it is the point of attachment for the tendon of the superior oblique muscle, which is responsible for rotating and tilting the eyeball. The superior wall itself has a distinct triangular form. This shape is not just an anatomical feature, it plays a crucial role in the spatial arrangement within the skull, allowing for the efficient placement of the orbit in relation to other facial and cranial structures. The lateral wall of the orbit, renowned for its robustness, is structurally formed by two distinct bones. Anteriorly, it comprises the frontal process of the zygomatic bone, and posteriorly, the wall is reinforced by the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. This wall stands out as the thickest and strongest among the orbital walls. An important anatomical feature of this wall is Whitnell's lateral orbital tubercle, situated just posteriorly and slightly below the frontozygomatic suture. This tubercle is not merely a bony prominence, it serves as a critical anchor point for the ligaments of the lateral rectus muscle. Additionally, it provides attachment for the suspensory ligament of the eyeball. The proper functioning of these ligaments is essential for coordinated and stable eye movements, underscoring the functional importance of Whitnell's tubercle in ocular mechanics. The medial wall of the orbit is formed anteroposteriorly by several bones, anteriorly, it begins with the frontal process of the maxillary bone, followed by the lacrimal bone. Further posteriorly, the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone, and towards the back, the body of the sphenoid bone completes the formation of this wall. The lacrimal bone, along with the frontal process of the maxilla, contributes to the formation of the lacrimal fossa, also known as the lacrimal canal. This structure is bounded by two notable crests, the anterior lacrimal crest, part of the maxilla, and the posterior lacrimal crest, attributed to the lacrimal bone. These crests not only define the boundaries of the lacrimal fossa but also provide structural integrity to the overall orbital framework. Notably, the medial wall is the thinnest and most vulnerable among the orbital walls this characteristic, while facilitating certain physiological functions, such as the drainage of tears, also makes it particularly susceptible to injuries and fractures. Any compromise to the integrity of this wall can have significant repercussions, affecting the eye's protective mechanism and potentially impacting the orbital contents. Lastly, the floor or inferior wall of the orbit is composed of a trio of bones, each contributing to its unique contour and functionality. The zygomatic bone, situated laterally, forms a substantial part of this wall, merging seamlessly with the facial structure to provide lateral support. Posteriorly, the orbital process of the palatine bone contributes to the depth and three-dimensional shape of the orbit and medially, the maxillary bone, which is centrally located in the facial skeleton. On the orbital plate of the maxilla, three key anatomical landmarks can be identified, each with its specific function. The infraorbital groove, leading into the infraorbital canal, marks the path for the infraorbital nerve and vessels. This canal culminates at the infraorbital foramen, an exit point on the anterior surface of the maxilla, allowing the infraorbital nerve and vessels to emerge onto the face. These structures are crucial for sensory innovation and blood supply to the midfacial region. A significant aspect of the floor of the orbit is its positioning directly above the maxillary sinus, one of the large paranasal sinuses. This proximity is clinically significant, as trauma to the orbital floor can lead to communication with the maxillary sinus, a condition known as an orbital blowout fracture. The floor of the orbit, being the shortest among the orbital walls, has a unique curvature and orientation. This feature is not just an anatomical distinction, it plays a crucial role in the distribution of forces within the orbit, particularly in the context of traumatic impacts, and in the positioning and protection of the globe. The base of the orbit, also known as the orbital margin, presents a distinctive quadrangular shape which is crucial for both functional and aesthetic aspects of the orbital and facial anatomy. This shape is delineated by four key borders, the superorbital margin, formed by the frontal bone, this margin is located at the upper boundary of the orbit. The lateral margin, this margin is unique as it is composed of two bones, the zygomatic process of the frontal bone and the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. Their union forms a strong lateral boundary, essential for the protection of the eye from lateral impacts. The infraorbital margin, formed by the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process of the maxilla, this lower margin plays a critical role in supporting the lower eyelid and in providing a pathway for the infraorbital nerve and vessels. 
the medial margin, constituted by the frontal process of the maxilla, it borders the orbit on the nasal side, contributing to the medial support and structure of the orbit. Each of these margins, with their unique bone composition and location, collectively contribute to the quadrangular structure of the orbital base. This structure not only defines the shape of the eye socket, but also provides a solid framework that protects the eye and supports the surrounding facial tissues. Furthermore, the orbital margin is clinically significant as it is often the site for surgical approaches in orbital reconstructions and is a critical landmark in the assessment of orbital traumas. The apex of the orbit aligns precisely with the medial portion of the superior orbital fissure. This fissure is not just a gap in the bone but a critical gateway allowing nerves and vessels to pass from the cranial cavity into the orbit, thereby facilitating eye movements and sensory functions. Positioned just above and internally relative to the apex is the optic canal foramen. Nestled within the sphenoid bone, this foramen is bounded medially by the body of the sphenoid and laterally by its lesser wing. The optic canal foramen is of paramount importance as it serves as a conduit for the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. Furthermore, embedded within the ethmoid bone, which is part of the medial wall of the orbit, are two additional foramina, the anterior ethmoidal foramen and the posterior ethmoidal foramen. These openings are crucial for the passage of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal nerves and vessels. The ethmoidal foramina connect the cranial cavity with the nasal cavity and the orbit, ensuring a continuous network of nerves and blood vessels. This network is vital for providing sensory input to the nasal mucosa and the skin of the nasal dorsum and eyelids, as well as supplying blood to the ethmoidal air cells and dural coverings. The orbit contains several key openings that serve as pathways for nerves, blood vessels, and connective tissues, facilitating the function and communication of the orbital contents with adjacent structures. Here's a summary of the primary openings of the orbit, the optic canal, this is a narrow, cylindrical channel running obliquely through the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone near its junction with the body of the sphenoid. It opens into the skull at the optic foramen, creating a vital passage between the orbit and the middle cranial fossa. The canal transmits the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. The superior orbital fissure, a comma-shaped gap located between the roof and the lateral wall of the orbit, it is bounded by the lesser and greater wings of the sphenoid bone. The fissure serves as a conduit for several cranial nerves and the superior ophthalmic vein. The inferior orbital fissure, connecting the pterygopalatine fossa with the floor of the orbit, this fissure is located between the greater wing of the sphenoid and the maxilla. It allows for the passage of the infraorbital nerve and vessels, as well as the inferior ophthalmic vein, and facilitates communication between the orbit and the infratemporal fossa. Lastly, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina, these are situated in the medial wall of the orbit, within the ethmoid bone. They transmit the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, veins, and nerves, connecting the orbit with the ethmoidal sinuses and facilitating sensory innovation to parts of the nasal cavity and the eyelids. Having completed the descriptive anatomy of the orbit, let us now turn our attention to its blood supply. The orbit receives its vascularization from an intricate anastomosing network of vessels, which originate from both the internal and external carotid artery systems. Among these, two arteries are particularly noteworthy, the ophthalmic artery, as the primary arterial supply to the orbit, the ophthalmic artery is a critical vessel. It is the first major branch of the internal carotid artery and enters the orbit alongside the optic nerve through the optic canal. And the infraorbital artery, this artery, a branch of the external carotid artery, supplies the lower part of the orbit. Starting with the arterial supply, the ophthalmic artery is the first major branch of the internal carotid artery and serves as the primary arterial supply to the orbit. It emerges medial to the anterior clinoid process at the point where the internal carotid artery exits the cavernous sinus, a crucial venous channel situated at the base of the skull. Initially following an intracranial path, the artery then transitions into the orbital cavity through the optic canal, closely accompanying the optic nerve. Upon entering the orbit, the ophthalmic artery extensively branches out, providing a rich blood supply to a variety of orbital and ocular structures. Its collateral branches can be broadly classified into two groups based on their supply area, branches supplying the orbital contents, 
These include the lacrimal artery, the supraorbital artery, the ethmoidal arteries and muscular branches. And branches supplying the globe and related structures, among these, the central retinal, the short and long posterior ciliary arteries and the anterior ciliary arteries. The ophthalmic artery has its origin on the anteromedial surface of the internal carotid artery. Its course through the cranial and orbital structures is divided into three segments, intracranial, where it runs inside the cranial cavity, intracanalicular, as it passes through the optic canal, and intraorbital, within the orbit itself. As it traverses these regions, the ophthalmic artery gives rise to several branches, each serving specific structures, the central artery of the retina, supplies blood to the inner layers of the retina. Arteries for the optic nerve, provide nourishment to the optic nerve. The posterior ciliary artery supplies the choroid, ciliary body, and iris. The lacrimal artery nourishes the lacrimal gland and lateral upper eyelid. The supraorbital artery, it provides blood to the forehead and scalp. The ethmoidal arteries, anterior and posterior these arteries supply the ethmoidal air cells and nasal cavity. The muscular arteries, these branches supply the extraocular muscles and the palpable arteries, they provide blood supply to the eyelids. The arteries' terminal branches include the dorsonasal artery, which supplies the upper part of the nose, and the frontal artery, nourishing the forehead. The infraorbital artery, an important component of the external carotid system's contribution to the orbital blood supply, has its origin from the maxillary artery. The artery enters the orbit via the inferior orbital fissure, located between the greater wing of the sphenoid and the maxilla. This fissure serves as a passageway for nerves and vessels, including the infraorbital artery, allowing them access to the orbit. After entering the orbit, the artery travels anteriorly along the infraorbital groove, a shallow depression on the floor of the orbit. It then proceeds into the infraorbital canal, a narrow channel within the maxilla, which protects and guides the artery as it moves towards the face's surface. The infraorbital artery eventually emerges onto the face through the infraorbital foramen, located just below the eye. Here, it terminates by anastomosing with the transverse facial and buccal arteries. The venous drainage of the orbit occurs mainly through two major veins, the superior ophthalmic vein, this vein forms from the confluence of several smaller veins. Among these are the frontal veins, which include the supraorbital and supratrochlear veins, and the angular vein. The superior ophthalmic vein is responsible for draining blood from the upper part of the orbit and surrounding structures. It travels posteriorly along the roof of the orbit and drains into the cavernous sinus. The inferior ophthalmic vein, this vein drains the lower portion of the orbit. It often has connections with the superior ophthalmic vein and also drains into the cavernous sinus. The ophthalmic veins, both superior and inferior, have wide-ranging anastomosis with the veins of the nasal fossae, the pterygoid plexus, and the veins of the face. A unique aspect of the orbital veins is their valveless nature. As a result, the direction of venous drainage in these veins is heavily dependent on pressure gradients. This means blood can flow in different directions based on the relative pressures in the connecting venous systems. While this allows for flexibility in blood flow, it also makes the orbit susceptible to the spread of infections from the face or nasal cavity to the cavernous sinus, a condition known as cavernous sinus thrombosis. In conclusion, the orbit's complex anatomy has significant implications in clinical practice. Understanding the intricate anatomy of the orbit is pivotal in various clinical scenarios, especially in diagnosing and treating orbital fractures and ocular pathologies like tumors. The orbit's structural complexity and its integration with surrounding tissues make it susceptible to various injuries and diseases. Orbital fractures are among the most common issues encountered in clinical practice related to the orbit. These fractures can occur in any of the orbital walls, but the floor is particularly vulnerable. This vulnerability is due to its relatively thin bone structure and its location above the maxillary sinus, which can create a weak point. In cases of orbital floor fractures, a notable complication is the entrapment of the inferior rectus muscle. This muscle plays a crucial role in controlling downward eye movement. When it becomes entrapped in a fracture, it impedes normal eye movement, leading to clinical symptoms such as diplopia, where the patient experiences double vision. Diplopia is particularly noticeable when the patient attempts to look upwards, 
as the restricted inferior rectus muscle cannot properly move the eye downward in coordination with the other eye. To diagnose such conditions, the Lancaster Red-Green test is often employed. This diagnostic tool is effective in evaluating ocular motility disorders. During the test, the patient wears red-green glasses, and a light source is moved in various positions. The patient's perception of the light, in terms of its alignment and color separation, helps in assessing the alignment of the eyes and the extent of muscle entrapment.